This episode is brought to you by Avalanche and Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Enjoy. So what happens when you know, storing and transmitting value um, and exchanging value, where the cost of that goes to zero and it becomes programmable? Like it's going to be, what I was saying yesterday is at least a thousand X increase in the net world output of payment transactions, like at least. And, you know, M2 money, which is sort of the, the TAM for, uh, for stable coins, um, is like $120 trillion. All right, everyone. Special episode per usual coming. I feel like I call every episode a special episode these days, but that's generally how I feel. Um, we are joined, if you missed uh, the weekly recap last week, Santiago Roel Santos, ex Parify, been in the industry for nearly a decade now, has joined Empire as a co host. Super lucky to have him. Uh, and also the special guest today, Mr. Jeremy Lair, the CEO and co founder of Circle. Welcome, Jeremy. Glad to uh, Thank have you here. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, this might, uh, I got to fact check this, but you might be the first uh, returning guest to Empire. So oh, I'm very honored. Very. So. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> very, very excited to have you back. Um, Jeremy, I mean, it was pretty interesting prepping for this because you guys do so much now. Um, and I, I think it's interesting for two reasons. One is just because you do so much. It's interesting uh, to figure out like where we want to guide this conversation. But the next thing is, you know, when I got into crypto, like the the app that I originally bought all my crypto on was the Circle app, right? And and you guys had just raised a bunch of money from Goldman and and you guys have pivoted the business so much. And so now the way I think about Circle is kind of in three pillars, really two main pillars. It's like you've got USDC, which is enabling uh, kind of programmable money to move freely across the internet. And the other way that I view Circle is like almost with corporate bank accounts. I feel like bank accounts is maybe the, uh, the wrong way to, to phrase it, but like the circle accounts for businesses, it's a B2B thing. And then the third kind of pillar is, uh, is the seed invest uh, acquisition that you guys made. So I think it would be helpful to just hear from you, like what is your master plan with all of this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know about, about a master plan. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. What, what's on the whiteboard? What, what are we scheming up yeah. here? <laughs> I mean, I think like at, at, a, at a very high level, I think, you know, what, what kind of brought us in into starting circle and the and the high level ideas what were were that you know what we think of as traditional money like dollars or pounds or euros um as well as like crypto money like bitcoin but but very specifically like when we think about traditional money that um it would it would effectively become um expressed in in a in a crypto money form factor in a digital currency form factor and that it would be there would be protocols um, that allowed people to directly transact in these you know dollar digital currencies, euro digital currencies, etc., um, over the public internet. The same way that we have protocols to um, exchange data and information and messages, sort of open, permissionless, global, etc. But the ba basic idea is that, that that would that would transpire. This was like eight and a half years ago when we we're getting started. That would transpire, and that that would lead to a world where um, you know, essentially value storage, value transmission would just become like a free service on the internet, just like moving data and, and content and communications are, are free services on the internet. And um, that would be really powerful in and of itself because that would unlock a lot of value. But, but more importantly, it would, you know, dramatically increase the velocity of money. It would dramatically increase the, the ways that money could be used. Um, and then I, I think secondarily, back eight and a half years ago, people were talking about programmable money. People were, the idea of programmable money was emerging. The idea of smart contracts, you know, you could say it was sort of ideas on napkins. There were some white papers, but like that was really powerful, a very, very powerful concept to me as someone who worked on programming languages and virtual machines and app infrastructure during my career from very early days of the internet. I was very captured by the idea of like, dollars as a native data type on the internet and programmability, knowing of course that you had, you know, the, the, the programmability that came with the blockchain was one that had, you know, openness, interoperability, very, very high security assurances, settlement assurances, these other, other kinds of things that were inherent. And that if you had that, that you could reconstruct what I kind of call like the time value of money 
um, uh, use cases. So if you could move money instantly at no cost and you could program it, well, then all of the different ways that you do have, you know, the, the time value of money comes into play, which is you know, borrowing and lending, investing, uh, saving, all these things would move to this kind of infrastructure and you could create a, a kind of new, new kinds of global, like truly internet native, from the ground up internet native financial institutions. So that's what we wanted to build. Um, and I think the surface area, you know, as I would say, like the verbs of finance, there are a lot of verbs of finance. Um, and I think they're going to get expressed in really different ways on this infrastructure. And you're seeing that, right? The innovation that you have in DeFi today is just like people expressing the verbs of finance and code in these incredible ways. So I guess kind of coming back to your question, like we want to solve more and more problems um, using on-chain um, programmable money infrastructure. And we think that that will unlock tremendous value for people, households, firms, et cetera. We're focused on doing that, um, you know, for, you know, primarily facing like businesses or facing businesses that, that do themselves face lots of consumers as well. So more of like a platform um, a, a kind of position. Um, and, you know, so when you, you look at those pillars, as you talked about them, there's sort of the standards and the infrastructure. And then there's the kind of what we think of as, you know, ultimately we, we think every business in the world will have like a, a digital currency bank account um, and they're going to use it for payments and treasury and, 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 and treasury infrastructure and, 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 and various forms of commercial finance. They're going to use that because it'll be superior to what they could use in the kind of legacy financial system. Um, and, you know, part of that is helping businesses form capital uh, as well. So, um, you know, one of the really exciting and powerful things about true internet native finance is the democratization that takes place, the ability for people and firms to raise capital directly on the internet, to, you, to do that on a global basis. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we anticipate that capital markets themselves will become entirely digital asset based and entirely internet native. And so the, the kinds of services that we could provide to a business could interact with, with all of that. So that's like, if you want to sort of describe it at a very high level, how at least I think about it and kind of, um, you know, d directionally when, when I think about, you know, where, where we might go. Yeah. And, and Jeremy, one of the things that I think uh, from my vantage point, I've, I've always felt that stable coins really were the Trojan horse. It was the killer use case of, of a lot of this technology where before that it was very difficult to build prediction markets, to build all these different applications. But the minute that you layer on top of that, something like USDC, like, which is effectively, I think a digital dollar, then a lot of these use cases become all of a sudden very, very applicable. And so yeah. I'm curious from your perspective, if you could give us a little bit more insight into that evolution at Circle of launching yeah. USDC. And, and for our listeners, I think it would be uh, quite interesting to hear that because I think USDC has become quite powerful in, in DeFi and just in, in other blockchains like Solana. And so, um, you know, it's been pretty remarkable to observe that. So we'll love to hear. Yeah. How, how that I mean, I, th I think it, it, it kind of goes back to like founding ideas where you should, you know, what we believed it would become possible to take, uh, you know, what we think of as traditional money, i.e., the liabilities of a central bank, like that's what a dollar is, or, or the liabilities of a government, a U.S. Treasury bond, right? These are those are what dollars are today in the real economy. Like dollars are, you know, you know, government treasuries and 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 Federal Reserve cash, right? That that's what dollars are. So if you could take 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 that form of of dollars and exp and give it the the form factor of digital currency, that'd be super super powerful. Um, and that was what we envisioned very early on. Now, in 2013, there wasn't a way to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of, um, I think, um, members, technical members of the community in the early days of, of Bitcoin that, you know, were, you know, essentially proposing ideas like colored coins um, and, you know, the idea of issuing assets on top of Bitcoin. There were people who wanted to take what was the script uh, language in Bitcoin and extend it so you could do more flexible forms of contracts and other things. And, you know, we actually thought in, in 2013, when we started building Circle, like, that's going to happen, like, th th that's going to happen. And when you have that, then you could actually build what we what we called like an HTTP for money, like a protocol layer for dollars and fiat on the internet. Um, and we expected that to emerge. Now, interestingly, it didn't go the way we thought. 
So we started by trying to build a consumer experience where you could take dollars or pounds or euros and instantly transact them through Bitcoin itself. So we're using Bitcoin as like the settlement layer. There were all kinds of issues with that, right? Like Bitcoin was not that fast. The fees actually got somewhat expensive. It could handle very few transactions. And so the, the overhead of kind of converting in and out of Bitcoin to do these digital currency transactions was really problematic. Um, and then, you know, basically in, in late 2016, um, Ethereum, you know, was sort of an answer to the issue of the, you know, the, the, the perceived in some ways in, in very, various parts of the community, lack of progress in, 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 in moving towards some of these ideas of like issuing assets and smart contracts and more generalized use of this technology. And that's, you know, Vitalik Buterin, obviously, like he left the Bitcoin community because he was really frustrated that, th that some of these ideas weren't moving forward. And so it was like a clean room view. But then in 2016, we sort of looked at that and said, OK, now those building blocks are there. We could actually conceptualize and build a protocol for what we called fiat tokens, but um, you know, a, a, a protocol that could do that. And, um, and so we made a decision. We actually announced it in December of 2016 that we were kind of uh, stopping using Bitcoin um, and that we were working on a new open source project um, to, on Ethereum to enable fiat um, you know, f fiat transactions. So people didn't really pay much attention then, but th we talked about that. And then we basically came up with the design of, of USDC, put out a white paper later in 2017, and then launched it in 2018. But, in, you know, I think in that, you know, we were still working on the same kind of core ideas that we started the company with. But I think that at that point, when we looked at solving the problem, it was sort of, we, we took a very different approach. We said, let's, let's build a protocol and let's offer it almost like a market infrastructure. So not, you know, be focused on like we're owning the consumer relationship, but instead make it something that anybody could plug into. Um, and that's part of the idea of you know, protocols and DeFi is sort of very much built like that. But that was sort of how we decided to go to market with it um, in 2018. And we partnered with Coinbase, um, who helped with some of the technical um, work on it over time and, and obviously has been huge in terms of the issuance and distribution through their, their retail portal. Um, but I think, um, you know, that, that was, again, kind of conceptually how we thought about it. And, and I think, you know, it, it is really just trying to fulfill those early ideas of just having a, 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 a native form of dollars on the Internet that are programmable. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, people are, are, are building with it. And so yeah. um, I, I think by mid-2019, um, you know, roughly a year after USDC launched, we were like, this, this has product market fit. This has really good product market fit. Like all the emerging DeFi protocols were using it, wallets, mm -hmm. exchanges, it was getting liquidity. Um, and so, you know, we, we, uh, we then kind of doubled down and built a lot more around it as well. Yeah, I think it's um, one of the things that I want to touch on is and there have been a lot of iterations and type of stable coins, um, some more decentralized than others. And of course, I'm curious to get your perspective as, as, as when you were designing the system. I mean, there is there is and correct me if I'm wrong, there, there is centralization risk. There is essentially yeah. someone depositing. Um, you know, dollars in a bank, and then there's essentially a receipt that gets yep. issued, and then that that is the USDC that is circulating this economy. But it is, you know, how do you think about that? Because we hear criticisms of USDC being centralized and it yeah. essentially being a systemic risk to DeFi and this source system that pretends that aims to be fully decentralized. So I'm curious how you think about the yeah. role of USDC in this economy. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, I. I, I I look at I, I, I look I agree with that actually like I, so I, I, I'm not I'm not going to say hey that there's centralization or that that's risk right you know we're in dialogue with regulators about this on a like literally like the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department and Congress and I just got called to testify to Congress and you know like this is a live issue where the government really cares like wait a minute you're doing digital dollars you're doing them on the internet. How, you know, what are the rules? How are we going to deal with that? And so that does like that's real risk. Right. So from a from a crypto user perspective, it's like, what if, you know, something dramatic happens and like this is all locked up or or liquidity is 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 eliminated because, you know, the, the way that this has to function changes. Right. Like those are like I, I think those are legitimate concerns. Now, obviously, we are very aligned with the idea of 
being able to use digital currency like USDC on the open internet, on permissionless blockchains, through DeFi protocols, like that is very, very core to our mission and vision, what we're trying to support and do. I guess philosophically, right, I think our, um, our belief was that if, if we wanted, um, you know, the, the, the use of public chain infrastructure to become like a, a really critical part of the way mainstream commerce and finance happens, like corporations everywhere using this as a, as a payment and settlement medium, um, commercial financial applications, leveraging this and building this and building on top of it um, for all the building blocks of what we think of in finance, that it needed to be a hybrid system. Um, and, and um, you know, in back in 20, you know, 14, I, I remember going and doing, you know, like going to like Bitcoin meetups and presenting this idea of hybrid digital currency and what that would be. And, you know, for, for I think for, 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 you know, Bitcoin maximalists, it's like, you're out of your fucking mind. What are you doing? Right. First of all, <laughs> dollar, like, why would I ever want to do something with a dollar? Yeah, and second of all, totally. it's like this centralization risk and all this sort of stuff. So like, like. I think, though, I guess my view has always been like a hybrid model for now is what is going to get this to scale. Um, and mm -hmm. and I think having seamless interoperability with the existing um, financial market infrastructure is really, really important to getting this to actually become mainstream scale and get, you know, the biggest companies in the world. And I'm not just about the biggest mm -hmm. companies in the world. Don't get me wrong, because most of our customers are startups, but but like mm -hmm. to get lots and lots of, of, of firms using this. Um, they, they need to know that it, it has that um, that liquidity, basically, and backing right. and that it's a compliant infrastructure and, and those kinds of things. So we, we've always believed that a hybrid model was going to be at least for dollars and other major fiat currencies, the most popular model for mm -hmm. a while. And um, I think I actually am very bullish about um, non fiat backed algorithmic, um, you know, uh, stable coins. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea even of stable coins that are not pegged or stable against uh, a reference of the dollar, but could be something else, right, to purchasing power index mm -hmm. or, or things like that, um, that could actually over the long run, once people and, and businesses became comfortable with this form of money, um, could actually become global units of account um, that are used really, really widely. But I think we're still a long way off from that. And so I'm actually very supportive and interested in in some of the things that are that are happening and experiments that are happening there. And I think there is within DeFi, of course, I think there's going to be a large base of of, of participants that actually want to to be native in a decentralized only asset. And so I think there's a lot of room for that to grow as well. Um, and I, so I don't think it's like a zero sum game where like only one or only the other. I think there's actually a, a lot of different types of users that want to use this infrastructure and, and that have different kind of fundamental philosophies and design centers that they care about. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because uh, historically, sometimes I feel that folks in crypto uh, especially early adopters are not very practical of what really needs to happen for this technology to get, to go mainstream. And I think sometimes the criticism is you're taking shortcuts in order to get there. But I, I think this hybrid approach, I want to dig more into that because a lot of, a lot of what we hear today from people that are skeptical of crypto is look, these are all just speculative use cases for this technology. It's only trading, it's only leverage. Um, but I'm curious to understand if you could talk a little bit more about from your vantage point, what are the real kind of use cases that you see for, for a stable coin like USDC and, and what are you seeing from, you know, especially with COVID, I would assume that a lot of businesses, yeah. you know, finally woke up, look, our employees can't go to a brick and mortar a branch and, and all of a sudden the stable coins become sort of the de facto way to pay people. So I'm curious yeah. to I talk mean, about those been, real use cases. It's been fascinating to watch and we started to see this. Actually, yeah. I mean, like if you if you actually look at the charts, like COVID outbreak, like started in February of of, of last year, like it was in it was in China. And then it just and, and actually it really like kicked in. And actually, the Asia market was ahead of the US market. And you started seeing stables in, in particular USDC and, and Tether um, grow really fast. Um, and we've grown the fastest, just the growth rate's been, been like a thousand percent growth last year, a thousand percent growth this year, like really fast. Um, I think, um, we started seeing basically in like that March, April 
of last year, we started seeing all this growth, but we are, we started seeing businesses coming in saying, I want to use, I want to, I want to get accounts so that I can do, use this for payments. And that's just grown and grown. So now we have, you know, if I, if I go and look at the like stream of account signups that happen, I kind of look at like, we, we, we see when businesses sign up, we can kind of see like, what's the use case, just the number of businesses that are looking at this just directly as a payment medium is, is growing um, really quickly. And I think there's some, there, there are a number of things. I think there are many entrepreneurs, um, business owners who've actually learned a lot about crypto and have realized in their own dealings that this is a super efficient transactional medium and they're bringing that into their businesses. Um, so that's something we've seen. I've, we've seen a lot of proliferation globally. So you see USDC as a stable d digital dollar growing in Africa, growing in Latin America, growing in Asia. So you're seeing the, the sort of emerging market demand grow. And there's obvious reasons for that, right? It makes a lot of sense there'd be emerging market demand. I think you're also seeing, um, because USDC is like an open protocol um, that others can implement, like, um, the various like wallets and exchanges all around the world connecting to USDC. And so now I can like, I can move USDC to India and get it into rupee in minutes. I can move it to Mexico and I can do it actually in seconds now, cause it's moving on some of these newer chains that move faster and cheaper. I can get it into other in, in Argentina, Brazil, um, Japan, Korea, you know, in, in all these places. And so you're seeing like currency pairs get wired up to this and that's, creating, you know, for, for businesses that figure that out, it's actually quite, quite powerful. And there's a lot of individuals doing this too, but we, we sort of see it primarily through the business side. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that happen. And then I think you're seeing this kind of crossover where there's more and more, you know, end user applications that are not just trading crypto, but are in gaming and entertainment and art and culture and all these things that are being built on crypto. And many of those, want to have a transactional medium. And so they're, they're leveraging USDC as well. And so it's, it's crossing it into, into some of those, um, also. And I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're just, we're seeing that continue to evolve. Um, and then I think, you know, last but not least is, um, more and more businesses are just waking up to the fact that in a inflation environment, uh, where cash is basically losing 5% of its value, every year, there's a lot of cash still idle and, um, and, and, and there's crypto yield and there's stablecoin yield and that's grown and that's grown you know, significantly. And so creating a way for businesses who may not give a crap about trading Bitcoin or, you know, uh, the, 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 the speculative side of this, and they may not even be at a point where they're like, Hey, we're going to use this as a payment system, but I'm actually very comfortable with the idea that I can move value into a lending vehicle that's, you know, paying six or 7% interest mm -hmm. uh, on short, on short duration collateralized kind of models. So that that's actually a really interesting one that's bringing lots of different types of businesses into this for the first time who the, the, the real value is, Hey, this is a, a, a new alternative way for me to deploy short term cash, um, which is really powerful. And I think I've always sort of said that, you know, crypto yield, uh, you know, uh, it, it may be the first thing that businesses actually get into before they start realizing, wow, the stable coins are a really powerful transactional medium and then start to integrate it into different ways that they transact. So, so really what you're talking about, Jeremy, is like up until now, it feels like borrow and lend in crypto is primarily for capital markets movement, right? It's, I think the yield is usually uh, derived from uh, institutions who want to borrow for trading. Yeah. Um, and that's still, that is still very much the case. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's I was gonna say, like I, I'd assume it's still the majority of the case, but like, when does all of, when does the borrow and lend look more like traditional capital markets where obviously there's a uh, borrow for uh, like funds who want to generate alpha and trade and things like that. But when does it become more like commercial finance? When does commercial finance yeah. actually move on chain? Yeah. It's something we think about a lot. And I think um, our, our belief is that, you know, what, what we see today with DeFi is, is sort of the very tip of the iceberg of how capital market structures will evolve, including debt capital market structures. And, you know, you know, de debt capital markets are like the source of commercial finance. And so I, I think there are, you know, there, there are going to be protocols and there are going to be 
um, markets that are established in protocols that provide ways for institutions um, to directly supply capital, borrow capital, unsecured. Uh, so, you know, that's really critical when you think about commercial bank lending. Commercial bank lending is largely unsecured. I mean, the, 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 they may have, you know, covenants, right? Like I get to see your balance sheet, I get to see your cash flows, you got to keep your accounts with me, like your typical kind of stuff. Um, but I think increasingly, the mechanisms of the, um, the, the sort of matching of, of, of capital needs can be done, including unsecured forms of capital and, and, and effectively on-chain underwriting that can support that as well. I think those things can emerge and I think they can emerge at a global scale. Uh, and that's really exciting that a, a market participant could access a, cap, a debt capital market that exists on chain, that's very open and accessible uh, to any, you know, any household or firm around the world. Um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to get it to the point where, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to this as a, say, a, a small business owner that's trying to grow and I want to borrow $250,000 to hire, you know, five more employees so that I can, you know, open my next restaurant or, or what, what, what have you. Um, but I, I think that is where we're headed. And so then the yield, so to speak, is is more like the the traditional kind of income that can be generated off of uh, of, of of kind of lending in in the in the quote unquote real world. So so it like uh, if you look like I don't know eighteen twenty four months in the future, like right now in traditional capital markets, you can get an under collateralized loan from your bank if you have enough assets. So like I I just got a mortgage from Wells Fargo and it was a complete yeah. nightmare, right? And it took like hundred it was like ninety five days or something. It was a total nightmare. Yeah. Right now in crypto. Uh, you can get a loan like this, right? But it's an over collateralized loan on something like Aave right. or Compound. So right. is there a world where Circle enables under collateralized loans based on your on-chain activity? I mean, there are a lot of things that, that folks are looking at around how do you do um, under collateralized lending on-chain. And there are protocol projects that are experimenting with on-chain um, on -chain reputation. There's some challenges with that. Um, uh, a, 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 as well, um, but what, because there's no, no, no credit score, right. In crypto you need yeah. like, a social graph and all that kind of stuff or. Yeah. So people are combining social graph and they're combining on chain activity and, and looking at ways to do that. So I think those are interesting experiments. I think, um, one of the things, and this gets to the hybrid model that I talked about earlier is, um, you know, a huge missing piece of blockchain finance right now is identity. And, you know, really a, a really critical piece is if there's a way to have cryptographic proof of identity, cryptographic proof of claims about my identity that can be relied upon by smart contracts or by just direct counterparties that are interacting on chain, um, that can unlock a huge amount of value. It, it also is something just from a kind of compliance perspective that I think is a necessary precondition to this being a mainstream financial market infrastructure that could work at consumer scale and, and so on. So I think it's a missing piece in a lot of ways, but I think in particular, um, it's a critical piece to enabling deeper institutionalization of things like debt capital markets on chain. Um, and, um, you know, between Oracle's on chain data, decentralized identity models uh, and, and, and cryptographic proof of various claims about identities. If you put those kinds of things together, then I think you can accomplish an enormous amount. Um, and, and so that's stuff that I'm really excited about. And I think there's a good amount of attention on all of these issues. And I think we'll see real progress on that in 2022. Let me extend this out even further then. Okay. So Circle, enable, Circle with USDC enables uh, company to company money transfers. Like a better wire, or or company like, or company to individual or individual company. To company. Individual. I mean, yeah. any, I mean, any, I mean Blockworks, for example, like full transparency. We 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 pay some of our employees in USDC, yeah. and we now request USDC payment instead of wire. Yeah. So like we under, it's just a better product. Yeah. Is the you, way you need to get your 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 upgraded uh, circle. I know account. we need our circle account. I know you now we have know. like a treasury account where you can get yield and and you have uh, multi users. So you can have the different members of your team having access to the account. It's like a so 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 a we we do need to get that. But b like if you extend that out far yeah. enough. You can in, you can pretty clearly see a world where Circle becomes one of the largest banks, right? One of the largest banks, not only in the yeah. U.S., but one of the largest banks in the world. 
And yeah. uh, on one hand, I'm really excited by that because I really like you and believe in you and like, you know, crypto native companies and things like that. On the other hand, it's like decently antithetical to uh, kind of the, the ethos of crypto is like, okay, did we just create a, recreate like the traditional well, financial yeah. system? I, I, I think like the, 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 like I have to come back to first principles, which is that all of every, everything that we're doing is built on open interoperable infrastructure. Anybody can build a digital wallet. Anybody can build a, well, not anybody, but like people can build crypto wallets. People can build custodial services. People are going to do it all around the world. They're going to build it in markets all around the world. And they're going to offer accounts and services to individuals and institutions. And this is like, you know, if you take something like uh, mail protocols or messaging protocols like SMS or SMTP, um, you know, they're open and interoperable. Um, you, you might use a mail client on your Android device that's completely different from what you use on your Mac, and it all just works. It all just works interoperably. And I think that's what we want to see for the financial system. And um, I, I think you know, by, by really trying to get these standards to be widely adopted, that creates the basis for tons of different companies to be able to build up value around that. Like, I don't see a world where we're like the the, the, the dominant commercial account in Japan, right? Japan's got, it's going to have amazing entrepreneurs that are building amazing services for, for, that are way more catered to the Japanese than that, or the Koreans or whatever, like that we do. Like we, we certainly think we can build a, a, a significant business. Um, but I think by, you know, supporting permissionless public chains and, and building standards that are all on the public infrastructure that are open and accessible and interoperable to everyone, that's actually like super valuable. At, at, a, at a global level. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're going to compete like everyone else um, to build great, you know, high quality experiences on top of that. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you talk about multiple chains and open and interoperability among them, obviously Circle first took off in Ethereum and then now in Solana, it's up to what, you know, started three, now it's at 30 billion or something. Three point. Um, yeah. Three, three point three yeah. five. But who's counting, right? right? But who's counting off right? an order? Yeah, I'm sure you have dashboard. Yeah. So I'm curious um, how you think about there is certainly a lot of discussion amongst, um, you know, the crypto community and there's factions, you know, you have the Ethereum camp, Solana camp. What is your perspective um, as USDC obviously operating across chains? Uh, but I am curious from your vantage point, like what was the impetus to go to Solana and not perhaps other chains? And, and what do you see there that uh, is, is most exciting. Yeah. Well, a, a couple things, actually the first next chain, as we say, was actually Algorand. Um, so, uh, and then, and then we launched Solana and, and, and Stellar and, and we've, we've done others. Um, and I think, um, you know, if, if you go back to the, to the conceptual kind of approach that we took with USDC is think of USDC as a protocol, um, just like internet protocols, like HTTP is a protocol and, or, or uh, you know, like a, 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 a kind of file format or a protocol, like these are the examples that I use from, from other parts of the internet. And it's really key that like HTTP works on any operating system, right? It, you know, if I'm building a, a smart refrigerator and it uses like an embedded Linux, like I can build a web browser that works with every website, r r roughly speaking. And so I look at my, my, myself, I look at public blockchains as operating systems. And they're, they're, many of them are in fact providing, you know, data, transactions, computation. They don't do everything an operating system does, but for a particular class of applications, these are like operating systems. And, you know, you, 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 just like you want your, your digital photos to be cross-platform or your digital media to be cross-platform and not locked to a particular operating system or device, you want your digital dollars to also be cross-platform. And I think the real thing was for us was um, clearly there's a lot of innovation happening in public chain infrastructure. And I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a just like I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, I'm not a specific smart contract chain maximalist, right? I believe that, um, you know, the, 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 there is real competition and there's real innovation. And, you know, if you go back to 2019, and you, and you can kind of see like the Ethereum 2 roadmap was going to take a really long time. Um, and there were really compelling, you know, n new chains that were that were merging. And so we made a decision to, you know, support USDC on multiple chains. Um, and so we've, we've done that. 
Um, and we'll continue to do that. Now, there, there are how many hundreds of chains. We're not going to you know, do it. There's the diminishing returns um, on that. But I think things like Solana, we got very excited about. Um, we were excited about other chains as well. I think you know, Solana um, has had a really interesting confluence of projects um, and primitives that have been built on it that then have that composability concept um, was there. And I think um, we, you know, we, we were very, very excited. We had worked very closely with Sam Bankman Fried for a long time doing business together. And I think saw what, what they were building um, on top of this and, and really felt strongly that this actually could develop into a, a really robust ecosystem and it needed USDC. Um, and so I think USDC was a, actually a significant unlock for, uh, for, for, for Solana. And, and I think it can be really powerful for other chains as well. I want to ask you a very just, uh, we talk about this a lot, uh, which is, do you think that users care about decentralization? Um, and then I am curious to understand the composition of the user base that is using USDC today, but perhaps just starting there, um, that's just a more philosophical question. I mean, it really depends on who, who you're talking about, right? I mean, I think they should care about decentralization. Um, I mean, like th there's a great piece by, is it Lynn Alden? Um, that she just published, which was looking at basically like, you know, effectively like centralization risks with proof of stake chains, including Ethereum um, and, and centralization risks of stable coins. And in particular, centralization risks of stable coins on proof of stake chains. Um, and, um, and it's a really great read. And I think it actually really unpacks the essential issues uh, when you compare something like Bitcoin to what's happening with these other chains. And I think one of the things that she does really well is she looks at, you know, these are trade-offs. There's trade-offs that exist. And I think adherents of proof of stake, um, you know, believe that they can achieve meaningful decentralization, but there's real risk of, olig there's oligopy, oligopoly risk uh, uh, through staking ownership, concentration of wealth, um, those kinds of things. And, and then, you know, hard forks actually become political decisions that are made by the oligopoly. And is that actually, you know, the, what, what, we, what we're all here for? Like, does that, is that actually an infrastructure that, you know, the world's going to say, yeah, we're going to depend on that. And, and the whatever, seven people that own the, you know, th th this amount or, or, or what, what have you. So I think that those are real risks. And I think from my perspective, do users care? I mean, I mean, like the the like uh, crypto token punter on a DeFi protocol. Do they care? No, they probably don't. They probably just want fast, cheap trades. I'm just being kind of blunt here. Um, but I think um, for people who are really thinking about this as a as a really meaningful economic infrastructure that society and the economy and financial systems are going to get organized on, they do care. Um, and so I think the, the deeper you are in the industry, the more you care. Um, and, and, and the more that you're maybe just an end user, maybe the less you care. Um, and, and so that's a natural tension that exists there. And I, I think, um, you know, the, the whole, you know, the whole vernacular of decentralization is, is something that even policymakers are now having to get their heads wrapped around. Um, you know, that, that's actually, it's becoming a, a policy issue and, and that's, that's pretty amazing. So I, I think it's going to become something more people are aware of for sure. I guess just like zooming out a little, like I am very curious to understand, like I know you're very close and um, just going to talk to regulators and help educate them about this technology. Um, I am curious, uh, you know, I, I don't want to talk about regulation too much, but I do think it's important uh, just given everything that's going on. Um, I do want to wrap it in this broader context of what is your view of crypto over the next, you know, two, three, five years and what could, what could go very well. And at the same time, what could materially derail this movement that we're seeing? Cause I, I think it's captured sort of the imagination of, of, of generations, but at the same yeah. time, it, it does at, at times feel fragile in turn components of this yeah. um, system. So I'm curious to get your perspective on that. I mean, <laughs> it is fragile. Like I, 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 meaning like it's still very young. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of old enough to have been through like different generations of the internet and, and actually working on infrastructure during those. And like, you know, I, this, it, these analogies are never perfect, but like, it kind of feels like, you know, whatever, 1998, 1999, 
um, this, this period of incredible enthusiasm. There's so much startup activity, but actually the infrastructure is just not there, right? You, you know, all the, the visions and promises, like people are executing these ideas, but like the stuff is breaking. It's the, you know, the, 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 the phrase back then was the worldwide wait because it was just everything was so fucking slow. Like you couldn't like do anything. And it was just everything was just pushed to the limit. And, and it was fragile. And at the same time, though, like, um, you know, you could see how the infrastructure would improve. You could see how, you know, broadband would get lit up. You could see how modern, you know, like standards for like the way that content and user interfaces could be expressed would improve. Like you could see all these things and you could see that those would happen. And I think that's kind of where we are right now. Like the reality is to use cryptocurrency, including like USDC in, in the every, in the everyday you know, world, it's just not a great user experience when you compare it to what the, the, the fidelity of expectations that people have. Now, at some level, it is actually like a 10 X improvement. So, you know, for, for like, you know, for people who actually deal with like moving money and stuff, like it's actually like a 10 X improvement. It's a, an improvement in terms of privacy and security. There's a whole bunch of huge improvements that people who are tuned into those things can see. And so the underlying is there. But I think like, I do think the, 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 the technology trend and the level of investment, the, not just like capital, but just like raw IP generation and, and entrepreneurial activity, it's highly global and it's moving at a, at a fast pace. So I think it's, it's sort of unstoppable in that sense. Like it's happening, it's being built and it will reach billions of people. I think there are gonna be challenges. You're gonna have parts of the world that, that really treat it really, really differently where it, it maybe struggles um, more, I think you're going to see, you know, we, we, you know, it's, it's actually amazing to me that we've seen, you know, multi hundred million dollar rug pulls, you know, DeFi protocol hacks, you know, all this sort of stuff. And yet it's like, people just keep going. Um, and which, which suggests there's a lot of resiliency there, but I, I think, you know, there are regulatory risks, um, for sure. And I think it's really, really critical that, the the that you know good actors in the industry really focus on the fundamentals because what regulators are concerned with are like bad things happen um, and that can be you know huge financial losses um, fraud crime you know market integrity issues and so there's a lot of bad actors and there's a lot of of risk from an infrastructure perspective and I think there needs to be more self-policing and there needs to be more, you know, r real attention driven to that and standardization, certification, self-regulation, these kinds of things that, that we have to see more of that. Cause if that doesn't happen, then it's going to be a blunt force instrument that tries to do that uh, mm -hmm. largely from people who don't really understand it fully. And that can have really negative unintended consequences. Empire is proud to be supported by Avalanche. There is a layer one war heating up in crypto and Avalanche is at the center of it. Avalanche is one of the fastest smart contract platforms in the industry. I've been looking into the ecosystem recently and I'm honestly amazed by how fast it's growing. Here are three reasons why I'm so intrigued by Avalanche. Number one, Curve and Aave, two of the biggest DeFi protocols are in testing right now for Avalanche integrations. Number two, new projects. These are not just NFT clones. AMM knockoffs and lending protocols. These are new projects, NFT projects, play to earn games, really, really interesting stuff happening in the Avalanche ecosystem. And number three, Binance just re-enabled C-Chain integration. What in the world does this mean? This means that you, the user, can directly withdraw to your MetaMask, which previously was a pretty big user bottleneck. Thank you, Avalanche for sponsoring Empire. We are going to continue to explore Avalanche in future episodes. Hope you enjoy it. I would recommend that you do the same. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. You would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. 
That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH, Polygon, as you can see here, BSC, they recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago, pretty exciting. If you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in, let's say I wanna swap you know, 0.2 ETH, for USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. Actually, the worldwide wait, I haven't heard that before yeah. because I wasn't yeah. around then, but that just makes me so excited about crypto and like what's coming. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I've had some really interesting conversations with folks who are, who were around back then, like Joe Lubin, who was yeah. at Princeton when, you know, they were working on just like HTTP and HTTPS or HTTP. I spoke with Mike Belshi, who was at Netscape, um, yeah. back in like, I, I don't know, 96 or seven or something like that. And, you know, they just have these amazing stories, right? Of like, you, you go to load like a picture on the internet yeah. and you can go get a coffee in the lunchroom and come back yeah. and the picture's still loading. Well, actually, it goes back even further, like images. The way that you got images in, in like 1990 on the internet was you the, through these publish and subscribe message boards called U U Usenet, which was a protocol that allowed you to like subscribe to something. And so people would basically take JPEGs, break them up into tiny, tiny parts that could fit into like the message format of the protocol. And then you'd have like all these, like just like the binary code of all the individual pieces of the JPEG, you would you'd subscribe to this, it would kind of download to your computer, and then you'd have a piece of application that would reconstitute all the parts and then actually render the image. And that was actually like <laughs> the cutting edge. Like that was how image distribution happened. I mean, that, that, that was actually, you know, whatever that was, I, I spent a lot of time with, uh, with that. So I guess what I want to ask then is like, okay, so you've got that, right? 20 years later, you have Netflix, you have you have streaming, right? You're we're sending well, I, I, don't, I don't use Snapchat, but like, I think younger kids use like, they send disappearing images. I call an Uber on my phone, which sounds insane to my mom that like, I would get in a random stranger's car, right? Which was like rule number one not to do. And so there's no way when you're sending little bits of JPEGs to predict what would, what the, what free information flow would, would enable. But we got Snapchat and Instagram and Uber, uh, Netflix. So like when you think about like the thesis behind Circle is that programmable money equals a massive unlock of value. Like what is what is that Uber, Netflix, Lyft, Snapchat that that programmable money unlocks? So my short answer is we don't know. Um, and actually, I was I was giving a talk yesterday at a J.P. Morgan conference. They had actually had a conference on like the crypto economy, which was you know they're getting into it. But um, the uh, uh, one of the things that I that I said is, is is exactly on this point, which is that no one could predict what would happen when you basically reduce the cost of, of moving information and communications to zero. And what ended up happening was what I call the net world output of information, like million X, right? The net world output of communications activity, like however, 100,000 X, it just like, it just increased at a scale that just, it was hard to predict that just the velocity and amount of information communications that would happen in the world would be bigger. So what happens when, you know, storing and transmitting value um, and exchanging value where the cost of that goes to zero and it becomes programmable? Like it's gonna be, what I was saying yesterday is at least a thousand X increase in the net world output of payment transactions. Like at least, it's probably like similar, if you look at the curve of communications activity, Right. It's going to be that kind of thing. And so when we talk about like payment volume and like how much transactions happen and so on, I think w the numbers that we see today in the world are going to be a tiny, tiny percentage compared to what we'll see in 10 years or 15 years as this happens, like tiny. Um, so the net world output grows. And then in terms of like what like this idea of like the killer apps, right? People 
people mash things up, right? No one, like people, people thought like, okay, it's going to be really cool to have a smartphone that can have apps. It took a while for that to like, there was Symbian and Nokia and there was like Palm Pilot and there was, you know, Windows phones and it was all awful. And then finally, like someone got the screen right and the fidelity right and the OS right and chips got fast enough and, and they got like the ability to do that. So that was cool in and of itself. People thought, okay, there's gonna be apps. Well, that's great. Um, people thought, okay, it's still slow, like 2G and then, you know, 3G, like, okay, there's an unlock. Bandwidth is better. That's like third generation blockchains. That's like bandwidth. It unlocks velocity, capacity, etc. What can you do with that? Not sure yet. Okay, you stick a GPS in the phone. That's cool. Turn by turn directions. That, that's like what people thought. It's like it's going to replace my, my, my Carmen or whatever the, 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 uh, the GPS device is, right? But no. An entrepreneur said, I can mash those things up and I can reinvent logistics and transportation. Like that was like a creator, you know, Travis, you know, who came up with this idea um, and mashed those things up. So what are people going to do with frictionless programmable money and, and that, that exists and, and, and where financial arrangements can be manifest in a trustless way globally? Like, what are people going to do with that? I, I think we're gonna, our minds are going to be blown. Um, we don't know is my short answer. Um, and that's exciting. Do you think, um, related to that, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is DAOs, this coordination, not just of capital, but also of human capital. And, and I've seen you tweet a lot about that and interested in that. So I'm like along these lines, like, yeah. you know, obviously how do you see DAOs fitting into this equation and, and, yeah. and, and what is really interesting from your perspective? I mean, the way I look at this is, um, you know, society and the economy are evolving to be more global and internet native. And we have like, you know, 150 year old architectures for how labor and capital are coordinated. And the joint stock corporation is sort of the, the principal form, the LLC, these types of, of forms. And capital markets and banking actually responded to and grew out of the needs of like the joint stock corporation. But I think we can build better ways to organize labor and capital. And I think we can do that on chain. And I think we can do that with structures that where ownership, governance, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the entering into the nexus of contracts that actually constitute output and relationships, that can move on chain. Um, and I think DAOs are like an early indicator of that shift. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be really exciting because I think we're basically inventing new global corporate and organizational forms that will be far, far better at organizing um, human activity. And so that's my view. I think that we're, that, that's why I'm so excited about it. I, I, I actually think that's really, really a, a, a really key thing. I, I just, I did, a, we did an event called Circle Forward for all of our employees and we had a lot of guests and uh, Aaron Wright. Was this was the one, one where you were DJing or? Uh, that was, yes, so there was a talent show. Epic, by the uh, way. Talent show that 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 I participated in. Yes, um, the so at that at that event though we had some great great guests and Aaron Wright, um, who's super thoughtful on DAOs, um, was a guest and we just I just put up a podcast with him that was actually a recording from that event. But it gets into like this I think the substance issue here, which is we're seeing the emergence of new organizational forms that are entirely operated on the internet. Um, like truly end to end. Now there's so many gaps. There's so many issues. It's got to get connected to law. It's got to get connected to, you know, how do, what is recourse? You know, what, uh, you know, how do you, how do you have recourse with uh, a, a DAO? And those are really complex issues. And so I think there'll be an iteration and evolution of, of legal frameworks to deal with this emergence of these new corporate forms. So I, I'm, I'm excited about it. And I do think it plays a big role in the possibilities. Uh, and programmable money and DAOs like kind of are hand in glove, right? When you think about, are there innovations in the way labor relationships can work in, you know, yeah, I think there are. And so a DAO that has like protocols that are like labor protocols makes a ton of sense. So people are going to build labor protocols uh, that are going to be really powerful, that allow for flexible forms of work and interaction. And people are going to compose those and plug those in. And that's going to fuel these corporate forms. And I know we're bumping up on time here. The last question that I have for you is as someone that has lived through perhaps the two most transformational kind of technological revolutions uh, of our time, at least, 
how, what, what are some of the things that you, advice you could offer to some of the builders much younger um, that are coming into the space that are super excited? Uh, but I am curious for someone with your experience, what, what would be some of the messages that you would deliver to these guys that are coming into the space? Yeah, I mean, I, I was there and uh, I, I was in my 20s and like, you know, th- uh, thought everything was possible. And I felt like I was a radical and um, <laughs> and uh, 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 and, and you know, I was like, it's like the web is going to be the OS for everything. And like, you know, and like people are like, you're at you're nuts. But um, so I think like a lot of people who are building in crypto are like that now. Right. They're like, the, the, this is going to be like everything in the world, everything in the economy, everything, all, uh, you know, all this stuff. And they're right. So, I mean, I think like. Um, you know, there's a lot of advice that I would give. I mean, I think, um, um, you know, the, I mean, the, the, a lot of it's really basic, which is like, just like really, really focus on solving problems that people have. Like, you know, I, I just be really, really grounded in, you know, try, trying to solve things iteratively. Don't try and boil the ocean. Don't try and solve problems that people don't yet have. Um, cause you'll have, you'll have time to get to those. Um, so sort of like solve problems that people have today, even if your ambition and your vision is like way, way bigger, like you can take yeah. time and you're going to fail and like, you're going to fail over and over again. You're going to have as many failures as victories and that's okay too. Um, like I've had so many failures in my career. I've launched products that have failed and I've built products that have been super successful and, um, like, and you know, like. As I like to, the metaphor I like to use is like, when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, you have a vision and the vision is like the mountaintop. You can see the mountain, you can see the glorious mountain, you can see the top of the mountain. You have no fucking idea how you're gonna get there. And actually you're gonna pivot along the way. You're gonna like go up a path and you'll be like, shit, there's a rock face. I gotta go all the way back and I gotta go up this other path. And you don't know what those paths are gonna be. And that's what a pivot is. So pivot's not a bad thing, pivot's a good thing. It's part of your discovery process of getting there. So you, you, know, you need to be, you know, capital efficient enough that you have some some flexibility there um, uh, to, to 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 have that happen. Um, so anyway, that's like just riffing a little bit on on yeah, stuff I think about. Definitely, I mean, I think people forget that uh, Netflix started with DVDs. And, Absolutely, and the, the grand mission might have been streaming, but you know, it a was. lot of infrastructure. Yeah, I know Reed. I knew him back in the right? day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing a streaming video platform company. I was like, dude, you got to yeah, do yeah, this. Yeah. You got to do this. He's like, it's not ready. Yet. <laughs> Ready. Definitely. Yeah. Speaking of the mountaintop, Jeremy, we'll end with this. You're at last time we spoke. I think you guys were at 16 billion uh, for USDC. I think it's like 39 billion today. Probably going to be 40 billion in the next week or so. When do we hit a trillion for USDC? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we will. Well, of course you. You're not. You're a lifelong entrepreneur. Of course you think you will. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think like just the the the, the quick answer on that is. Um, I don't, I don't want to put an exact time frame on it, but I think that the utility value of, of like dollar digital currencies like this are very high. And so long as like these like market functions and capital market functions grow on chain and they, we see those develop, then it could very quickly get to a, a, a trillion uh, because then it's people are staying in it. Um, and, and they're staying in it for working capital. They're staying in it for their, their, their everyday use. And as that happens and we cross over from the you know, digital assets markets you know, world and the DeFi world into everyday working capital for people and firms, that's when it, it goes um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a much larger scale. Um, and you know, M2 money, which is sort of the, the TAM for, uh, for stable coins, um, is like $120 trillion um, so globally. Uh, so, you know, how long did it take Netflix or, or how long did it take, you know, e-commerce to get to 10%? It took like 20 years. Um, how long did it take, you know, Netflix and YouTube to get to 10% of viewing hours? It took like 15 years. So I don't know. I mean, 10% would be 10 trillion, but assuming the thing, the base continues to grow, I don't know. It could take, take a little while. Awesome, man. Well, we're, we're rooting for you. Excited to see it grow. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. I, uh, I know folks, if, uh, you know, they run businesses or entrepreneurs can go check out the circle business account. Um, yeah. and if you're a user and you haven't experienced USDC, or if you're a business uh, and you're still using wires, uh, go experience USDC because I think the best way to describe it is it's just a better product. So anyways, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on my friend. Yeah. Really enjoyed it.